I know why you're here. I know why you're here, because we're here for the same reason, all of us, me too, me especially. You're here, check me out on this. You're here because you want to grow spiritually. There's, that's really number one reason to be a part of a church, because together, right? this is right, isn't it? Because together, we can grow spiritually. You're here because you have this inner intuition that there's a deeper depth to go to. You want to grow. This scene here, this gospel scene, is from about two-thirds of the way through the gospel, give or take. But when I read it this week and wrestled with it, I thought of a scene that's towards the end of the gospel. I, be I bet you remember this scene. It's this scene around a supper table in which Jesus is saying goodbye to his disciples. And it's right before he died. He gathers them all together. And he says this to him. He says, okay, y'all, everything that I've done and all that I've said has been for a single reason. And that reason is so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. It's all for joy. Which has long had me thinking that when I follow Jesus, I'm on the road to joy. So that's at the end of the gospel. Now come back to this scene. Remember I said it's about two-thirds of the way through the gospel. These guys, the disciples, Jesus' close buddies, are on the road with him. Now they are on the road to joy. Because when you follow Jesus, you're on the road to joy. But they don't know it. Like, it's, it's lost on them. They haven't yet, like, that hadn't sunk into them. They've not yet gotten that lesson, but also they haven't picked it up. And because they don't know they're on the road to joy, they have this inner desire that I am well acquainted with. They are driven to try to, try to add something to the moment to make it better. Is that... Does that mean anything to anybody? You're in a moment, and you have this drive to add something to the moment to make it better than it is on its own. And what they think, now this is humiliating to me because I am them, but let me see if I'm the only one. They think that if their ego needs are satisfied, they will have inner peace. They don't feel okay or good about themselves or as good as they think they can feel on the inside. So if they'll add something to the moment, their ego needs will get satisfied and they'll feel better. And what they want to add to the moment is Jesus telling them that they are great, number one, and great, number two. Greater, that is, than all the rest of their friends. He, they want him to say, y'all are the best. You're my favorites. And naturally, the other guys traveling with Jesus down the road overhear this, and what do they get? They get angry. They get angry. They get jealous because they're afraid that if those two are great, number one, and great, number two, there's not, a, not enough greatness and love to go around. So <laughs> what should have been a sweet scene of Jesus walking down the road with some friends turns very, very negative. And Jesus just shakes his shaggy head. They don't know, but they're on the road to joy. So let's say something about joy. What is joy? Well, let, let me put it this way. There's such a thing as unshakable inner peace. I'm not there. I'm not even close. Like I am... I'm not even in the parking lot of unshakable inner peace, but there's such a thing as unshakable inner peace. And inner peace doesn't mean that you always feel good all the time. It doesn't mean that you don't get sad or angry or that you're walking around just happy constantly. Now, a person who has the gift, and it only comes as gift, 
of unshakable inner peace is grounded in joy. Now stay with me. Joy is the gift of a vivid realization that there is nothing missing in this moment, no matter what. Now that should sound to you like about the craziest darn thing you've ever heard, and if it does, I'm, I'm saying it correctly. Joy is an active awareness, like active, moment to moment. Joy is the gift of an active awareness that life itself is pure gift, and life is short, and we are here, one reason, to love, to grow in love. Therefore, now this is the part where you're, we're, we're, you're just going to just, like, we're going to go separate ways. Therefore, and when you email me, me and offended, or offended by what I'm about to say, I'm offended too. I don't like it either. So I totally agree with you. Therefore, there is a certain irrelevance to all outcomes. Because no matter the weather, no matter who wins the contest, no matter what the diagnosis brings, no matter how long the life or short the life or how good or bad the feeling, our call is the same. To love and be loved because we are God's beloved. Now here's a trick with joy. And are you picking up that joy is not a feeling, it's a theological concept? The trick with joy is you can't make the gift of joy happen. Stay with it. But you can assume an inner posture of openness to the gift. Do you see how I'm doing that? I do it involuntarily. This is a posture of openness, right? You want to give me something, baby? I'm ready for it. Now, imagine this exterior posture held inside. Does that make sense? So this is constriction. This is openness. Imagine that open posture held inside your body. That's what I mean when I say you can't make the gift of joy happen. You know, I'm going on a retreat this weekend. I'm going to feel joyful when I get back to work on Monday morning. That ain't work like that. You assume a posture of receptivity. You stop trying to wrestle happiness and satisfaction out of exterior things and instead surrender. Let go place our hope in God. Now somebody said, well, I want to grow spiritually, but I feel like this cat is trying to make me into a monk or a nun. But that's not it at all. No, no, no. <laughs> that's not it at all. It doesn't mean being grounded in joy, being open to the gift of it, doesn't mean that you become some kind of pious, boring church mouse. Far from it. In fact, what you become is more engaged at a deeper level with all the people, places, and things in front of you. Because what happens when you surrender is that almost immediately you're turned back to everything and everybody that you've let go of, to love them with God. And inner, look, can I say one more thing about it? Inner peace grounded in joy. Y'all, I'm afraid you don't know you're on the road to joy. You are on the road to joy. Mostly when I'm on the road to joy, I don't flip and know it. Inner peace grounded in joy doesn't mean you don't have feelings. Oh, I don't know. He's just joyful. No, 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 no. Feelings are a gift. Frankly, do you want to be? Feelings are fun. I love feeling sad and then angry and then flummoxed and then happy and then grouchy and then bored and then silly. Because feelings are the salt and pepper of life. They spice things up. It's just that when I'm grounded in the gift of joy, I can feel the feelings and not be crushed or carried away by them. Did that make sense? 
See, joy, I would say one more thing about joy. See, joy smiles and sees the person right in front of her as God sees her, which is as an infinitely loved, broken person. So if I'm on the road to joy, we are on the road to joy. There's no if. But I'm on the road to joy, Charlie, and I want to assume the posture of receptivity to get the gift of it. So this vivid realization becomes my reality. So there are probably as many ways to assume the inner posture as there are people who go at it. But I am thinking about two this week, and they are loosening my grip on negativity and loosening my grip on cash. Huh? No, can we, somebody said, don't talk about money in the church. I said, oh, come on. We can talk about anything. Huh? First, negativity. Let me tell you a story. This is a true story. I am not proud of it. In fact, I'm ashamed of it. Okay? So here's a story about negativity and loosening my grip on it. So this is a true story. So I recently saw a person whom I know do a thing that I thought was outrageous. This was not long ago. It was nobody in this room. This person does not belong to this church, but they are a real person who lives in my real life. I thought what they did that I witnessed was disrespectful and misguided. Anybody ever seen anything like that in your... Yeah, okay. So, I live close to here with a girl with whom I am quite taken. Truth be told, we're in love. That's a different story for a different way. But when I saw this outrageous thing done by this person that I thought was misguided and disrespectful, I got it in my little head that this girl with whom I live and whom I'm quite taken with ought to know about it. So I rode home from work at the end of the day on a subtle, or truth be told, maybe not so subtle, wave of negativity. When I got to our house, I got out of my truck and I bounded up the front steps, went through the front door, ready to rock. Found this girl in the kitchen. She was standing at the kitchen counter. She was bent writing down something on a piece of paper. I did notice out of the corner of my eye that she had set out plates for supper. Each plate had a nice salad on it. Blew by all of that. Said to her, not hello. Hey, darling, how are you? How was your day? But guess what? And then I proceeded to launch. I mean, man, I'm not proud of this. I mean, full like a rocket ship into this gossipy negative story that I've been storing up, given rinse-free space in my head all day long. And I got the first part of the story out. And do you know I had a feeling? Can you ever tell when someone's not listening to you? <laughs> like they ought to listen to you? I had this intuition. I thought, this girl is not listening to me. And I said as much to the girl. I said, I don't think you're listening to me. And she turned to me when I said that. And she had that pen in her hand because she was not going to take much of a break from what she was doing. And she said, here's the deal. You ever have someone say that to you in your own kitchen? She said, here's the deal. I am working right now. That's very pleasant, by the way. It wasn't me. She said, I'm working right now on our family's calendar for the coming week. And it would be really helpful if you would start working on finishing supper for this evening. And she said, we don't need the negativity that you've just brought in. And by the way, nothing, that I was listening, she said, and nothing that that person did is surprising. Like them acting outrageously is not at all surprising because they are outrageous. <laughs> That's kind of, so she said, Charlie was like talking to Obi-Wan or something. She said, so no big deal. Now at this point, yeah, have you, do, you, do you know what I'm, have you been in this scene? So at this point, I have a choice. Hmm? No, 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 you got a choice. I have a choice. I got feelings that are generated inside of my body. They're all knocking on the door vying for, yeah, let's do this one. I have, I have a choice. I can feel, I can choose the feeling of being offended. I can choose the feeling of being hurt. I can choose to feel dismissed. Or I can choose, I choose this one a lot. I ch can choose to feel challenged, double down on my story, go at it again, and show this girl that I am right. Or... I can look down at the feet, at the ground below my feet, and see that yet again, I am at a fork in the road. I'm on the road to joy, but y'all, a lot of times, I don't, I don't act like it. I don't remember it. 
I can look down and see a fork in the road and I can pause. And in the pause, all your best stuff's coming out of the pause, by the way. In the pause, I can see that one way is the road to joy. The other way is to fear-based ego indulgence. Does anybody know about fear-based ego indulgence? An outrageous person did an outrageous thing. No big deal. Nothing about the moment needs to be changed. You don't need to bring that in here. And in the pause, this is what happened to me. In the pause, I remember that what I want more than anything is an ever deepening relationship with God. I want to grow. I want to fall further and further head over heels in love with God one day at a time for the rest of my life. I want to grow spiritually and negativity is poison in the garden of my growth. So out of the pause, a miracle happened. Hmm? I chose the road to joy which means I turned to the stove and stirred the spaghetti sauce. <laughs> Very briefly, I know, we're, I know we're there. Very briefly, to money. Don't worry about money, y'all. I mean, come on. Money is really, really, really simple. I'll tell you the truth about me and money. Come on, cash. I hold on to it because I'm afraid I won't have enough. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And I also alternately live in the illusion that if I can get some more money, I will be happier in this life. And when I get the urge to give and then tighten my grip, I'm going to hold on to it, I'm at that same fork in the road. I'm at that same pause. I'm at that same point where I can remember what I really want more than anything, which is to grow. And then I remember what my mom and dad taught me when I was a little boy, that when I give, I grow. I don't remember, my father was a preacher, and I don't remember very many of his sermons at all, but oddly, the one that I remember the best is a stewardship sermon he gave when I was about 10 years old. He stood up in front of the church like Betty Larson did, and he said, Carol and I give a significant percentage of our income to God through the church right off the top, and we don't worry about money. Now, we don't have any money, hardly, but we always have enough. That's what he said. And some months, it's darn hard. We wonder, is this going to work out? But it always does, nevertheless. And they closed by saying, when we give, we grow. And that seems like an odd sermon for a 10-year-old little boy to remember, but I filed it away. And now 40 years later, his testimony is my lived experience. Kristen and I, as the girl, we give a significant percentage of our income away to God through the ministry of the church, and we always have enough. And it ain't because we got tons and tons of money. And common sense supplies. This ain't no prosperity gospel pitch. Don't put that on me. Common sense supplies. We got a budget. We got a plan. She and I do. Most importantly, what happens, and this is what I have to remember, when we give, we grow. And my, my favorite line about giving is this. There are things that we don't do because we gave the money to do them away. And that is freedom. That is true, joyful freedom. And I know you, I know you like that kind of thing because I know why you're here. You're here because you want to grow spiritually. We all want to grow spiritually. We are all, each one of us, on the road to joy. And you know, we're going to let go of everything in the end. Huh? Did you know that? So why not let go now, says the gospel, this side of paradise, and make ourselves vulnerable to receiving the gift of an unshakable inner peace on the road to joy. Amen. <laughs>